Yesterday we defined refraction as the bending of a wave when it passes from one medium or one material to another. We know that refraction takes place because the speed of the wave changes when it goes from one material to the other. The speed either increases or decreases. So V goes up or down. As a result of that, theta will go up or down or the angle will go up or down. In addition to that, one other thing changes in this process of refraction. What is it? What's the other thing that changes? Yeah, lambda, the wavelength. So as V goes up or down, theta will go up or down. Lambda will go up or down. What doesn't change? Once the wave has been made, this variable always stays the same. What is it? Yep, the frequency, right. So V, lambda, and theta all are going to change when we go from one medium to another. Lambda is going to stay the same. Now, index of refraction we defined yesterday loosely as a measure of how much light bends when it goes from one medium to the other. But the technical science definition of the index of refraction is the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum, which is always going to be 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, to the speed of light in that medium. The symbol for the index of refraction is n. And if we look at the definition and translate it into an equation, it's going to look something like this. n is equal to c over v. You guys remember what c is? Even if you don't remember what c is, you can probably figure it out from the definition that's written on the board right now. Yeah, it's the speed of light in a vacuum, which is going to always be 3 times 10 to the 8. That numerator will always, in this equation, be 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. The denominator, v, will be a number that is either equal to or less than 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, or never be more. That means that n will always be either equal to or greater than 1. The, the further it is away from 1, the higher the value is above 1, the more light will bend as a result of this medium. The closer it is to 1, then the closer it is to air in a vacuum, and the less it will bend. We also talked about dispersion yesterday, which is a phenomenon where light splits up or EMR splits up when it goes uh, through a material like a prism, a glass prism or a plastic prism, or even water vapor in the atmosphere forming the rainbow. Why does this happen? Well, we learned yesterday that every material has a slightly different index of refraction for each different frequency or each different color. It's not great. The index of refraction is very, very close for red light to what it is for blue light, but it's not quite the same thing. Now, if the white light or the polychromatic light goes into this material at an angle, like you can see there in the prism, then what's going to happen is that each color is going to refract a slightly different amount. Remember, we just said that the index of refraction measures how much light bends. So if we have different indices of refraction, light will bend different. We have red light refracting or bending the least. We have violet light refracting or bending the most. Higher frequencies, i.e. violet, will disperse or refract the most. Lower frequencies, i.e. red light, will refract or disperse the least. Now, my suggestion for you is this. Don't memorize this because you're going to end up getting frequency mixed up with wavelength or something like that. Picture the diagram. You see the diagram on the board right now. Just ingrain that in your mind. Picture it so that when you close your eyes, you can see it. If you can do that, then it's easy. Then you know just by looking at the picture that red light refracts less. Therefore, low frequencies refract less than high frequencies. You don't have to memorize anything other than have this picture in your head. Today, I want to talk about refraction mathematically using an equation called Snell's Law. We know that as n goes up, if you go from a low index of refraction to a higher index of refraction, i.e. we go from air to water or air to glass, the speed will change. In fact, the speed will go down as a result of n going up. We also know theta will change. Theta also goes down. Theta is related to v. 
lambda will also go down because it's related to V as well. So as you go from one medium to the other and increase the value of the index of refraction from one material to the other, then V, theta, and lambda will all go down. Take a look at the equation that we have that describes the exact mathematical relationship. Sine theta 1. It's not theta 1. It's sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 equals V1 over V2 equals lambda 1 over lambda 2 equals N2 over N1. Why do you see it backwards at the end here? N2 over N1 instead of 1 over 2? Because the index is inversely related to the other variables. As N goes up, the rest of them go down. Theta 1, theta 2, V1, V2, lambda 1, lambda 2, N2, N1. Be careful. This is on your data sheet, but sometimes we just start get a little careless and we start writing this out, V1, V2, lambda 1, lambda 2, theta 1, theta 2, N1, N2. It's N2 over N1 because the index is inversely related to the other variables. Now, when you're using this equation, know that you never have to use all four parts. You're going to use two parts at one time. This part and this part. Or maybe it's this part and this part. Or maybe it's the first part and the fourth part. How do you decide which two parts to use? Depends on what you have given to you. Whatever you're given seem to fit the best, use those two parts to do it. Let's draw a little picture and label these variables so you know what they all mean. This solid line is our boundary between two materials. We're going to call this first material material 1. It has an index of refraction of N1. The second material is N2, or material 2. It's going to have an index of refraction of N2. We're going to make our ray of light coming against the boundary, and we're going to measure theta 1, the angle in the first medium, from what we call the normal line. You guys remember physics 20, what normal, what normal meant, normal force? Perpendicular. Yeah, normal means perpendicular, 90 degrees. We measure the angle of incidence, theta 1, from our normal line. Theta 2 will be measured from the normal line in the second medium. Say that N1 is 1 and N2 is 1.5. As N goes up, theta will go as n goes up, v goes, yeah, good. And then theta will also go, good. So we're going to find that theta 2 here, in this case, theta 2, as measured from the normal line, is smaller than theta 1. v would also be smaller. Lambda would also be smaller. So here's theta 1, theta 2. Here's n1, n2. v1 is just the speed here. Speed here is v2. Lambda 1, the wavelength here. And lambda 2 is the wavelength here. Finally, you see a table of values for the index refraction of various materials here. You don't need to memorize that table, right? You're given only one of those indices of refraction on your data sheet. But if you need something else, it'll be given to you in the question. Probably not in the form of a table. It's probably going to be buried in a page of information where it says use the following information to answer the next three questions. Okay, but it'll be there somewhere. You don't need to memorize any of that. All right. Let's take a look at uh, example number one that's on the example question handout that I gave you. It says, calculate the speed of light in a ruby. Now, there's two ways of tackling this question. The easiest way is to use the definition of index of refraction. N is equal to C over V. Right, the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in whatever material, in this case, ruby. If we rearrange this to solve for V, we get C over N. C is 3.00 times 10 to the 8. It always is. The index of refraction of ruby, if we go back to our table, is 1.54. When we do the math there, we end up getting the speed of light in ruby to be 1.95 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. That's the easiest way, I think, to solve this question. But the downside is this equation doesn't appear on your data sheet. There is another way to do it. You never have to use 
that equation that I just used. It's just helpful sometimes. The other way to do it is to say V1 over V2 equals N2 over N1. This is Snell's law, or at least two parts of Snell's law. Let's assume that we're going from air to ruby. That means the speed of light in air is 3 times 10 to the 8. V2 is what we're looking for. N2, the index refraction of the ruby, is 1.54. And N1, the index refraction of the air, is 1.00. If you rearrange this to solve for speed, you end up getting still 1.95 times 10 to the 8. So either way, use the definition of the index of refraction or use Snell's law. It doesn't really matter. It gets you the same answer. I think the first way is a little bit easier, but it does require you to remember an equation that's not on your data sheet. Okay, I got one more example for you, and then I'll let you work on a few questions here. Uh, this one says light passes from water to ice at an angle of 40 degrees. What's the angle at which the light struck the water ice boundary? So it's not worded real well, but what this means is that the, the light is going from water to ice and it's coming out at 40 degrees. We want to know what it went in at. Let's draw a picture for this. Sometimes we draw a picture, it simplifies things for us. Our boundary is a solid line. Our normal line is the dotted line. We're going from water to ice. The index of refraction of water, we'll call it N1, from that table is 1.33. The index of refraction of ice from that table is 1.31. We've got light coming into ice from liquid water. What's going to happen to that ray of light as it goes into ice from liquid water? The, the index of refraction goes down ever so slightly. What's going to happen to the speed? Up or down? Up by a bit, right? The index is not that much different, so the speed won't be that much different, but the speed will go up a little bit. What's going to happen to theta? It's going to go up a little bit. So if it's going in at theta 1, and we're trying to find the value of theta 1, then theta 2 will be a little bit bigger than theta 1. We already know the value of theta 2. It's 40 degrees. And so solving for theta 1 here, we would expect to get a value of theta 1 that is slightly smaller, not a great deal smaller, but slightly smaller than 40 degrees. So let's use our Snell's Law equation, or at least two parts of it. Sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 equals N2 over N1. If we draw the picture, it's a lot easier to keep this straight. Okay, a very, very common mistake is mixing these up. You might write down N2 over N1, but you still make it 1.33 over 1.31. Okay, N2 is 1.31. N1 is 1.33. And that's pretty easy to see when we have our picture drawn. We're solving for theta 1. Theta 2 is 40 degrees. Let's do this on our calculator up here so we can see the manipulation of this. I'm going to say 1.31 over 1.33. It's going to give me the right-hand side. And I'm going to multiply that by sine 40. Make sure your calculator is in degree mode. That gives me sine theta 1 is 0.6331. And now to find theta 1, I'm going to take the inverse sine of that. Which on my calculator is just second function sine of my answer, 39.3 degrees. Is that a reasonable number? When I get that number, I can be really confident, unless I made a mistake rounding or something like that, then I got the right answer. We went, we went down in our index ever so slightly. We should go up in our angle ever so slightly. And we did. We went from 39 degrees right here to 40 degrees right here. 
All right, we're going to give you a little bit of time right now to take a look at worksheet number 17. Number one to eight, please, for now on worksheet number 17. Let's spend a few minutes now extending this concept of refraction to a concept that we call total internal reflection. When light goes from one medium to another, or at least it strikes the boundary between the two media, usually it goes into the new medium and changes direction as a result of the change in speed. But every once in a while, it doesn't. Every once in a while, it reflects off of the boundary. It's kind of like when you're standing at the side of a lake or a river and you throw a rock in. When you throw it straight down in, where the, the angle is zero degrees as measured from the normal line, zero degrees, then the rock's, rock's going to go straight in the water. But if you increase the angle at which you throw it slightly so that it's off of 90 degrees to the boundary, like this, it's still going to go into the water, but it will change speed and direction when it goes into the water. It's kind of like refraction. If you increase it even more, it's still going to go into the water, but it's going to change speed more and change direction more. But if you increase it to a certain point where it's almost parallel to the ground, what happens to that rock? It skips. It doesn't go into the water. It doesn't change direction and speed. It just bounces off the surface. Sometimes that can happen with light as well. We're going to see right now, or at least in the next few minutes, when that happens. I got two pictures drawn here. One of them you can see, I've got light going from air to glass, and in the other one I've got it going from gla glass to air. We're gonna call this angle right here, theta one, when we're going from air to glass. Tell me what's gonna happen to this light ray as it goes from air to glass. As the index gets bigger, then V will get smaller, and theta will get smaller. So in other words, theta 2 will be smaller than theta 1, and it's going to look something like this. If I increase the angle a little bit more so that theta 1 is now bigger than it was before, theta 2 will also be bigger than it was before, but theta 2 will still be smaller than theta 1. Theta 2 will keep getting bigger as theta 1 gets bigger, but because we're going down from 1, or sorry, up from 1 to 1 1.5 in the index of refraction, then we're going to find that theta 2 will always be smaller than theta 1. You cannot get any skipping here. You cannot get any reflection taking place here. Let's go over to the other diagram now. Theta 1. This time we're going from high to low index, which means that the light is going to speed up, which means that theta is going to get bigger. So this time, theta 2 ends up being a bigger value than theta 1. If I increase the angle a little bit more to the blue line, theta 1 is bigger, theta 2 is bigger than theta 1. I'm going to draw another one here. This one's going to be red. If I increase theta 1 even more, what do you think is going to happen to this red line? Well, theta 2 is going to get even bigger to the point where theta 2 becomes 90 degrees. The light skips along the boundary between the air and the glass. This angle right here, a theta 1, we call the critical angle. It's the angle at which reflection begins to occur. If you're below that critical angle, right, the green one or the red one, you can see that we get refraction, as we saw over the last few minutes and working on the worksheet that you were just doing. But if we get to that critical angle, then you can see that something odd happens. Okay, reflection kind of begins to occur. If we exceed that critical angle, theta 1 is bigger than theta c, then there's no question what's going to happen. It's just going to reflect. So you can keep making theta 1 bigger. You're still going to get refraction until you make theta 1 big enough to be the critical angle, and then it's going to refract at 90 degrees. And if you exceed that critical angle, then it's just going to reflect. 
That's like throwing the rock in the water again, right? You throw it straight down, it goes in the water. You increase the angle a little bit, it still goes in the water. But you increase it to a certain point, we call it the critical angle, then the rock starts skipping. And at every angle above that, right, closer to parallel to the, to the water, it's going to skip. When you exceed that critical angle, the rock skips. When you exceed the critical angle, the light skips or the light reflects. Now, be careful. There is a fundamental flaw in that analogy that I gave you with the rock skipping. Okay, when you skip the rock, you're skipping it off of the air-water boundary. You're going from air to water. Total internal reflection with waves, with light, can't happen that way. You have to be going from high to low index of refraction. That makes sense? You can't reflect it off of air water. You can reflect it off of water air. All right? So total internal reflection is that phenomenon that happens when light reflects off of a boundary rather than reflecting. It can only happen when light goes from a high index to a low index, unlike when you're skipping rocks in the water. And it only happens if the angle of incidence is big enough. How big does the angle of incidence need to be? Well, it needs to be at or above the critical angle. Critical angle is the angle of incidence at which total internal reflection begins to occur.